860. Number 860. After this song, I'd like to ask William, if he would, to lead us in prayer before we go to our classes. As they're going back, I, I want to truly thank everybody for taking part in the Walk for Water yesterday. We had a, a great time. Uh, it, it was just a wonderful e event. And um, Steve and Celia and, and Sheila and, and different ones of you that uh, helped to arrange it and make sure that it went off the way it, it did, you know, it, it was just just a great event. And, and thank you all for being part of it. Um, we have Daryl with us today. He doesn't need any introduction, uh, Daryl and Robin. Uh, but at the same time, I want to tell you a little bit about why he's here. Uh, he'll explain far more. Uh, but um, he is working with World English Institute at this time, which is a way of teaching uh, people uh, from your own home. And one of the things that we want to try to do uh, here at center is to give each one of us an opportunity to find ways uh, of teaching others, whether it's through uh, just week-long campaigns or, or uh, you know, whatever it may be. And so Daryl uh, wanted to come up and to talk to us about this, and we, we think that it is a good work and something that maybe some of us may want to be involved in. And so we're giving him this, this opportunity and uh, very grateful that he uh, is is here for us. Thank you, Craig. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be able to be with you today. Uh, we are, hi, we are back into the area also. Just want to let you know we, uh, we've moved back into the area. We're located right back in my hometown, Horse Cave. I never... I never thought I'd be back in Horse Cave. In fact, I never planned to move back in, in Horse Cave, but uh, 
it looks like the Lord led us there, honestly. And so we're just, we're right back next to the church building, as a matter of fact. Uh, we bought the house that's next to the church building where Buford Fudge, you may remember Buford and Peggy, and they lived in that house. And the church has, uh, has owned it uh, since their passing and so have not sold it. And so we had the opportunity and, and uh, so we bought that house. But anyway, it's, uh, it's good to be back in the area. We're uh, obviously being back in the area, we should be able to see more of each other. Uh, several, uh, well, I say several years ago, a few years ago, I became more involved with World English Institute just as, as, a, as one of the teachers and uh, became acquainted with the president of World English Institute and the director of development. And, and, um, and so after about a few years and in, in, in just that, that relationship that we began and, and that also the working with World English Institute and the students that I was taking on, um, I, uh, uh, I, I got a phone call um, back in January of this year and they said, Daryl, we are needing some help and we're needing someone to go and to recruit teachers and uh, would you be interested? And of course I jumped at the opportunity and uh, because it's going to help me be involved and in not only with uh, the church here, not only locally but just in the United States uh, primarily, um, helping them to be able to reach out better. It's going to enable me to be able to help uh, World English Institute so that we can maintain the numbers of teachers as the numbers of students grow uh, with World English Institute. Let me take, give you a little bit of a background first of all with World English Institute then we'll get into uh, some more details about uh, some of the things that are happening. It started actually as, as, as an effort to reach into China. Um, Richard Addy, who is the founder of World English Institute, he started a, a series of lessons. And the way in which he was going to reach into China with uh, the cooperation with some friends of his, they were going to develop these lessons, but they were going to, they, they were going to present Bible lessons from the Bible, and it was going to be from creation all the way to as far as they could take it at that particular time, which would be all the way to Christ and the beginning of the church and their studies. And uh, they were gonna reach into China by helping those who would be interested in signing on uh, to learn English as they went. And so he, he, he through uh, the help of some others, uh, developed uh, a course in English grammar. So that it would be simple enough so that someone in China could take that course uh, along with maybe some audio that went with it and be able to study English grammar while they're studying the Bible. And so back in 1988 that was the dream and that was the plan. In 1989 things sort of uh, in China sort of fell apart because if you may, may remember back in 1989 when uh, uh, people rose up against the government of China, China really locked things down so that people the, their freedoms were taken away, what little they had, and so that uh, that really closed the door on th their efforts to be able to reach into China. Well, he continued, and they realized that, hey, this is not only going to be good for those who are in China, but this is good for anyone in the world that isn't uh, uh, an, an English-based English uh, country in which English is not spoken, and so they started reaching into the world. And since then, since then, it has grown I mean, it has really grown substantially every single year. Uh, last year, um, 30, over 37,000 students from around the world, over 200 nations around the world have studied through World English Institute, and they've studied the Bible as they went along. There have been many baptized, thousands. We, we actually don't know exactly how many have been baptized into Christ, but we, what we know of number in the hundreds, hundreds into the thousands and uh, so we just we know that the, there are many baptisms we have missionaries missionaries beginning to go back to the field now thankfully things are opening up the covid virus shut everything down missionaries had to come home it's the first time ever that missionaries had to leave the field some stayed but the majority of them came home 
And so there's a lot of fledgling churches, a lot of small congregations. There are a lot of new plants around the world that were kind of left on their own for a period of time without any help from American missionaries. And so then they're, they're beginning to go back now. Well, these American missionaries that are over there, and many who are not Americans at all, but have been baptized into Christ, and they have taken up the, the, the mission of Christ and, and, the, and the Great Commission, and they're, and they're working. They're using World English Institute to reach out into their own people. And so then many times what they'll do is that they will put an ad in the paper, in the local publication, so that, or maybe just post it somewhere uh, where... English grammar lessons, free English grammar lessons are being offered. And so then they, they will actually register, go to the website. And you'd be, you'd be amazed how many people today are on the Internet, on the web. Billions of people are on the web. Uh, I'm talking about those that are not only in the major cities, but those that have been in the outlining suburbs and, and in Africa and, the, the, you know, the, the hamlets have Internet service. Uh, and so they're able to access, and usually on these phones right here, it's, it, this, is, this is what they have. may not have the computers, but they have, these, they have these phones. And that's the way they work their lessons. They work these lessons through that. And so then, uh, so now they have, they have students that will sign on, and, and, and teachers from America will take on those students. And those that are really, really, really interested in studying God's Word and, and really get into um, wanting to study deeper, even become a Christian uh, and desire to be baptized, then they, we notify those missionaries and say, hey, we've got someone over here. Can you reach that person and so forth? So there's a contact to be able to, to reach them. That's not always the case in a lot of places. Not always the case. Uh, I have students in Afghanistan. I have students in... Uh, I have students in um, uh, uh, Somalia, for example. Well, you're not going to find churches of Christ in those countries. So it's going to be very difficult. If they want to be baptized into Christ, it's very difficult for them to find someone. We have to instruct them to uh, find a way for them to be baptized into Christ uh, on their own. And uh, so then, uh, World English Institute has grown substantially we've already we have been teaching our, our lessons have been given about uh, 3,000 per month now it's more than that we reached 3,000 on the 19th of last month and that was before May was over that was halfway through May and we, we had already reached 3,000 students that had studied and registered and studied so then so we we're, we're reaching people. Uh, we're reaching people we otherwise could not reach. We're reaching people that missionaries cannot get to. We're reaching people in, in greater numbers than missionaries would be able to do. And so this is one of the reasons why that that I really wanted to get involved with World English Institute because we're we're living in a different age now, and even since. Last year, starting last year, I don't know if you realize this or not, we're living in a different world. We're living in a totally different world. Now, we've been living in a different world for quite some time, but we're really living in a different world today. And we're talking about wanting things to get back to normal. Uh, I, I want to just tell you right now, it's not ever going to get back to normal, what we think is normal. But then also I have to, to back up and think, maybe normal is not what God wants anyway maybe our definition of normal is not what God wants. So we have to keep that, perhaps maybe that thought in the back of our minds too, that perhaps my normal, my normal, what I would call normal is not what God wants to be normal. And so then we have to stop and think. When we think about the changes that are in the world, we think about what's going on in the world, even in our own country, our, our country is just taking, uh, just to, the things are changing so quickly in our own country. And uh, I'm afraid in some cases it's not for the better. Uh, we, the church, are going to have greater challenges. And that, that means that we're really going to have to find uh, ways to be able to still get the gospel out. Uh, I don't think, you know, it's no secret to any of us for a long time, it seems like, that it's difficult for us to get the gospel into the homes around us sometimes. And we might, uh, we might have difficulty 
you know, years ago, I remember we would, we would go door knocking and we would find several people that would be interested and they would come and, and, uh, and, and or we, we would send out flyers and sometimes they would come and, and uh, or maybe we'd have a Bible study arranged. Uh, but the, I'm not saying those days are over, but they're more difficult now. And one reason why they're more difficult now is because the level of trust is less now than it used to be. It's much more difficult for people to trust each other. And I think that uh, what we've gone through in the last year has been a, a, a major contributing factor to the, um, to the, uh, the level of trust that we have in, in, our, in one another. And so uh, because of that, because it's more difficult for, to get people to trust us, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to get the gospel uh, into their hearts and so that they would, would hear the gospel of Christ. I think that that's where we're really going to have to start uh, uh, doing as Jesus did. You know, in Acts chapter 1, it says that it talks about, Je Luke writes, he talks about the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so his doing preceded his teaching. And I think the church is really going to have to get back to that. I, I don't know what you might have done yesterday, but it sounds like it was something service related. And, but that's what the church is really going to have to start looking into doing more of, doing more service, community service related things so that we can actually get into the hearts of people again so that they can trust us with the gospel of Christ. So Jesus began to do and to teach, doing preceded teaching, and that's what we're going to have to do in order to earn the trust of those that are around us. But you'd be amazed how the World English Institute could even help there. Because once you're able to reach into perhaps maybe someone's heart, you can actually take these lessons and study with them. Because this, you don't have to study the English grammar in order to get the Bible lessons. I have a student in uh, Somerset that wanted to study, but he said, I, naturally, I don't want the English grammar. And I said, that's okay. I can click a little button right here, and you don't have to study the grammar lessons. You can only study the Bible lessons if you want to. And so he's, he's doing the lessons, and we're still communicating back and forth, even though I'm no longer in Somerset. So that there's that opportunity. World English Institute is not only something in which we want to reach into the nations of the world in which there's only, where there's no English or very little English uh, being spoken, uh, but we can actually uh, use World English Institute as a means to be able to study with, with folks here in the United States. There's, there's a lot of people from the United States that do sign up. Um, naturally, there's more around the world, yeah, international. But let me tell you something that I've been talking about for a, a long, long time. And, um, and that is, and this, I've been talking about this perhaps maybe 20 years, but um, we've had, we've had the, the inflow of uh, international folks into our communities. And, um, and I remember how strange it was 30 years ago, how strange it was to see, uh, to, to see a group of Mexicans that were on the corner at Horse Cave. It was so strange to see uh, Mexicans uh, on the corner there. They were workers. They had come in. They were working the tobacco. <clears throat> and um, so you've had the influx of a lot of international people into our communities, not just the Hispanic, but you've got a lot of different nationalities, and many of them are not uh, English speaking, or at least they don't speak it very well. This is another area in which World English Institute can be beneficial, because the language barrier is such an issue. But they want to learn English. They want to learn English, because they are in this country, they want to learn English. And, um, and so then, if we can enable them so that they can learn English while studying the Bible, we have done two things. We've helped them to be able to communicate in the place where they've ch chosen to be home. And then secondly, we've helped them to study God's word, perhaps maybe for the very first time in their lives. <clears throat> so my hope is through World English Institute that um, maybe something can be started uh, somewhere in the area and we can uh, do something in the Hispanic community because the Church of Christ in this area has not, and we've really dropped the ball, to be quite honest with you. We've really dropped the ball when it comes to the Hispanic community. Um, typically, our denominational friends and neighbors are 10 to 15 years ahead of us. 
always have been. We've been we've we we lag behind when it comes to missions many times. We are we are um, uh, we are passive rather than active. We act rather than proact. And so then we um, uh, you know if if missions opportunity comes to our door, we'll take the action, but many times we don't take the initiative. And so we need to change that in the future. Uh, that we're, we're living in a changing world. We're going to have to really change with it. I mentioned a minute ago how that, that we have billions of people that are online now. Billions. Billions of people. <clears throat> I want you to think about this for a second. There have been, I can name, I can name five major movements in, history of the Lord, in the history of the Lord's church. Five major movements. The first movement, of course, is Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. That's the first major movement. That's when the church began and the movement of Christianity began uh, from there throughout the world at that period of time. The second major movement, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this one of the major movements, even though it is not, it didn't advance very much. It is the Reformation movement. Now, the Reformation movement came 1,500 years later, and the Reform, well, I'll say 15, roughly 1,500 years later. And the Reformation movement was really nothing more than just an, an effort, a movement to reform an existing religious organization that had departed from the apostles', the apostles doctrine. So they were wanting to reform it. So that, even though that was a movement, it was a movement nevertheless, um, the church was in hiding at that period of time. It came, they came out and was really hopeful that the reformers were really going to restore the New Testament church. They did not. Began to persecute the church once again. The church had to go back into hiding. I've done some history on that, and I've got some documentation where that is actually the truth. And so that they went back into hiding. The third major movement occurred, um, uh, let me think here. I've got it, on my, got it in my notes. This morning I got up and I was going to print my notes out, and my printer would not work. So I might have to rely on this a little bit. Yes, here we go. The third major movement is the Restoration Movement. <clears throat> the Restoration Movement, uh, we're very familiar with the Restoration Movement. We, our, we came out of the restora Restoration Movement, didn't we? We came out of it. That's, the Restoration Movement needs to be something that we teach our young people because you know how history is? If it's 200 years old, I'm not interested. You know how that goes. If it's 100 years old, I might be. Uh, but 200 years, I'm really not too interested in what happened 200 years ago. So we're, we're kind of like that in our nation. And our nation is sort of unique from the rest of the world because what happened 200 years ago over in Europe was like what happened yesterday to them. They have buildings over there that are older than this nation. So it's, we have a different mindset, but we need to teach our children history because history is very important. The Restoration Movement is where we began in this nation, in this nation. The church was always alive, but it really took roots and began in this nation. That's the third movement. Now the fourth movement took place after World War II. In World War II, our men and women went overseas, went to Europe, and they went to the Pacific, and they discovered that the world, essentially. They discovered the world and how the world was. You know what? those who were members of the church discovered there are there are no churches of Christ there was no representation of, of the church that Jesus established in these countries when World War II was over many of them went right back to those countries you take Italy for example Klein Payton and his family went back to Italy Parker Henderson he and his family they went over to what was it Thailand uh, you, uh, Richard Baggett and his family went to Japan. And so you've got different people that had, had, they went right back to the places that at one time they were fighting and they established the church. That's the, that's the fourth major movement. And that movement has carried on because what came out of that are the missionaries, many of whom you've supported through the years, not to mention Parker Henderson when he was there. And so then... Um, you've got to the missionaries uh, that have, uh, of the baby boomer generation continued that, and, and it's being continued today. But now here's, here's the fifth major movement in the history of the Lord's church. The fifth major movement 
is global internet evangelism. Global internet evangelism. Because the world is on the internet. And we have to reach them that way, and we are reaching them that way. Now, you've heard of World Bible School, haven't you? You've heard of, everybody's heard of World Bible School. World Bible School is, 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 is a partner, but we're under different roofs, in other words. We're, they're one, one organization that, that is reaching out in the way in which they have organized to do so, and World English Institute is another. But we're, we partner together in many ways. World Bible School cannot reach into Somalia. World Bible School, as good as it is, and it has really evangelized Africa to the point in which now there are more churches of Christ in, in Africa, in the continent of Africa, than in the United States. World English Institute reaches into Iraq. Into the, into the 51 major Muslim nations, we reach into every single one of them. Back a few years ago, I um, was um, studying with students, and I would choose always students that had an affiliation with uh, Christianity. Many of them do. <clears throat> they have some affiliation with Christianity. And so then I chose uh, uh, students that had that affiliation, even though they might be in, uh, you know, Indonesia, or they might be in, they might be in Africa, for that matter. Uh, anywhere, in, anywhere in those countries, that's what I would choose. And, and I was passing up the ones that were Muslim, because I thought, well, that'd be too challenging for me. <clears throat> I decided one day to choose one, and I did. And this this Muslim I chose. Uh, he was answering all the questions correctly and so forth and so on until we got down to Jesus. Then he began to tell me what he thought about Jesus according to Islam. And I didn't know exactly how to answer back. So <clears throat> we were about to go on vacation. So I ordered a stack of books on how to teach Muslims. And uh, so I ordered a stack of books. We went on vacation. I sat on the balcony. I don't like the beach anyway. They all enjoyed the beach. I just sat on the balcony with a, uh, a glass of sweet tea, and I just enjoyed myself as much as they enjoyed themselves in the water. And I studied how to teach Muslims. And I, and I came out of that with a way and approach to be able to approach Muslims to get them past the hurdles that they have in order to get to listen to Jesus. Now. Uh, I take all Muslim students now, all Muslim students, and practically every one of my students that I teach all get past the hurdles that they have. They, they all get past. So that now some are saying, I now believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now that's a major, that's, that's major for them, you know, because it's, because they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, but that's blasphemy to them. To even the thought of it is blasphemy that he would be the Son of God. You get them past a few hurdles so that they can listen to Jesus and understand some terms, you get them to understand. And that they, they, they come to these conclusions. Now, not all of them come to that conclusion. I had one, one Muslim uh, student of mine, she said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself by thinking that Jesus is the Son of God. And all I responded was, is that let's just listen to him. Let's listen to him as he speaks about himself. You know, and if we just listen to Jesus speak about himself, isn't that, that's no different than what we would do with anyone else, right? We would want anybody, you would want your next door neighbor, if your next door neighbor is not a Christian, you would want your next door neighbor to just say, you'd want to say, hey, let's just listen to Jesus and let's listen to him speak about himself. Wouldn't you do that? It's no different with Muslims because, you see, Jesus has the power. He has the power to overcome it, whatever it is that they face as being the obstacle. But I also learned that the same things that were stumbling blocks to, to the Jews are the same stumbling blocks to them. So when I learned that the same stumbling blocks the Jews had are the same stumbling blocks that the Muslims have, I studied the Bible even more, especially the Gospels, to see how to overcome those stumbling blocks that they were having because the answers were already there. 
So you just simply just study the God's Word to be able to do that. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not a teacher. I had someone just recently tell me he was interested in, in, in doing this, and he said, but I'm not a teacher. And I said, you don't have to be. That's the beauty of World English Institute. You don't have to be a teacher because the, the material teaches itself. All of the lessons come back automatically graded. You don't have to grade them. The grammar lessons. I'm telling you, if I had to take the grammar lessons over again, I probably wouldn't do as well as some of those do that are taking it. Uh, even though I've grown up speaking English. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in teaching grammar. Now, naturally, when you're writing back to the students, you do want to be a good example as much as possible with grammar. But uh, that's, not, that's not, not the priority. The priority is getting the Word of God into them. They're studying the, the English lesson that goes right along with the Bible lesson so that they, you're ta they're taking the Bible, the Word of God, and they're taking the English grammar with that lesson that has questions related to the grammar that's used in that particular lesson so that they're getting it in the grammar lesson, the Bible in the grammar lesson, and they're getting the Bible in the text itself as the reading lesson and assignment. And then they have discussion questions. And that's where in those three or four, maybe sometimes no more than three, discussion questions where it might ask the, the student about different things what they thought about the lesson and that's really where you actually kind of see them open up and it's really enjoyable to read some of the things that they say so then so then that's that that's how it's done that's how it's done um, and that's how we're reaching into the world uh, last night I was looking to see the numbers and you'd be surprised I think to see that uh, the numbers last night, <clears throat> we had 212 students waiting to be adopted by teachers, 212 students. They're on there, they're registered, they've done the introductory lesson and it's been sent in. Now they're, re they're waiting for a teacher to, to, to take them off the student board. Sometimes they wait as long as three days we try not to let them wait any longer than three days. If I go on there and I see that there's some students waiting that's been waiting for four days, I will, I will deliberately take those off the board because I don't want them to be lost. I don't want to lose them and they lose their interest. And then uh, there's 212 waiting yesterday. There's 210 of those that were men, 97 were men, women. Uh, 78 claimed that uh, they were Christian. 78 claimed to be Christian. Now that's largely coming from nations that where Christianity has gone into and, and uh, one form or another, you know what I mean by Christianity. It warm, one form or the other has gone into these countries. <clears throat> uh, India is a huge country, one of those countries where Christianity uh, has gone into it. So a lot of people claim to be Christian, but the thing about that many times is they may claim to be Christian, but they also hang on to Hinduism. I had a student from India, <clears throat> and um, and he he wanted to he wanted to say that yes, Jesus is Lord, but so is Krishna. In fact, he said he he said that Krishna is Jesus reborn to something that out of that effect. And I said, oh no. Uh, Jesus is Lord, and He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. In fact, Jesus is God, and and I and I and, and I've talked to him. I I wasn't rude or anything to him, but I did want him to understand that no, you can't mix you can't mix Jesus with Hinduism, you can't mix Jesus with Buddhism, you can't mix Jesus with Islam either, and uh, and so they you, sometimes you you have to point these things out. <clears throat> uh, he was always very kind. Never was rude. I never was rude to him. So there's uh, 62 of these 212 yesterday. 62 are Muslims, 52 are Hindus, and 11 are Buddhist. And um, so that's how many were waiting for teachers. The thing is, is that we're we're needing teachers. We're needing teachers. And I signed up some teachers in the last couple of weeks. And, um, and they've done very well. They've, they've each chosen 
to start about three. Normally when you, do, when you choose about three students, even though they've signed up, they've sent the introductory lesson in <clears throat> and it's been graded, you're able to make a couple of comments. And by the way, the introductory lesson, in the, in the introductory lesson, the Bible lesson is the parable of the uh, prodigal son. So they get to read that story. And it's amazing uh, some of the comments that you get three out of three questions about the younger son, the older brother, and the father. It's amazing about some of the, the responses that you get, but you're able to show them this is teaching us about God. Um, but uh, they send it in, and there might be one out of the three that will continue after that. Maybe one. What you need to do then is you need to go right back to the board and you need to pick three more. Then when you get enough students that you're comfortable with, you might be comfortable with two students that are continuing. You might be comfortable enough with three. You might be comfortable like some are comfortable with just about as many as they can take on. And uh, so then I talked to, in fact, I talked to uh, through messaging uh, uh, with one of our teachers in Salina, Tennessee yesterday and this morning. <clears throat> Over the years, I think he's done thousands of students. He's taken on thousands. I, I personally have taken on over a thousand since uh, over the last uh, four years. And um, I can count on one hand how many have actually gone through every one of the courses that, they, that WEI offers. I've really been able to get really close to and get and reach into the hearts of a lot of those students and to the point in which they've had to make a decision. Are they going to follow Jesus or are they going to turn away? And many of them, most of them, will turn away. Jesus said that. Many are called, few are chosen. So then many, are, many will turn away. The majority of them will not be baptized into Christ. Only a very few will be baptized into Christ. But for those that will, that's what makes this worth it. And for the hope that those that you're studying with will makes this worth it. So that's, the, that's what I'm doing and uh, in order to reach out now, and this is what I'm hoping that I can finish out the rest of my days doing, and uh, working, trying to get the gospel into as many hearts as we possibly can before time gets up. So then, I know I've left out a lot uh, of information and you may be thinking about something that, that uh, you might want to ask is there a question that you want to ask I'm, I'm sure that something will come to my mind in just a minute that I have forgotten to add but uh, I do have one student and she reminded me Robin reminded me about one student that um, that I took just out of random and um, <clears throat> he um, he's formally Muslim. Just when I took him on, he was fairly recently formally Muslim. He was baptized into Christ in, in Sierra Leone. He had to escape Sierra Leone, and his family had us to escape his family and go to to flee to Liberia. So that's where I picked him up. I picked him up from Liberia uh, on World English Institute. He became a student, told me his story, and so forth and so on. I went to uh, uh, the workshop in Lubbock, Texas, uh, at sunset in. Uh, 2019, and uh, was happened. Uh, was two directors of two of the satellite, not satellite, the branch schools in Nigeria were there, and uh, was just talking with them. And I happened to just mention about this student that I had in Liberia, and they they said, "Are you talking about Amara?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "Do you know him?" He said, yeah. And so then we got to talking about it. He said, we're trying to get him into, into school over here, Nigeria. So I went right back to Cumberland and I said, here's a student, one of my students, World English Institute students. We're trying, they're trying to get him over to Nigeria to go to school. And so he's, he's just recently, because of COVID, it was a huge delay in getting there. He's there. That's a success story. And it's one of the success stories that you could have if you wanted to become one of the teachers uh, with World English Institute. Keep in mind what I said is that if you're thinking, well, I'm not a teacher, 
a teacher is more of a student helper than anything. What you're doing is you're helping them, guiding them along as they go, as they work through these lessons, as, the as these lessons teach themselves. You are able to, as, as, uh, just, as, just as a relationship, they highly respect you as uh, that t uh, teacher. They highly respect you and they, they, they honor your ability to be able to not only help them uh, if they need some help, but uh, your Bible knowledge. They admire that. So now, I don't know if you've got any questions. Does anyone have any questions? We've got about five minutes. If, you, if class concludes about uh, 1045, does it? As, as it usually does elsewhere. Um, do you have any questions or anything? Yes, sir. Uh, a typical daily contact, I mean, is that every day you're probably going to be conversing or whatever you say with them? Well, it, we like to recommend that you, that you review their lessons and return them with two, two more lessons assigned to them within 48 hours. That's, that's kind of what we like to recommend. This is all done through? <clears throat> through, through, through the website. So, I mean, like, you, but you talk most of the time on the phone. I like to do it from my laptop. You can do it from the phone if you want to, if that's comfortable with you, but I like to do it from the laptop. Um, you could do it from a desktop for that matter, but it's just more comfortable for me to do it from there. Um, but my, gener my, my routine, daily routine, is I'll get up every morning to get a cup of coffee and I'll sit and work through my lessons. And I'll, I'll have, I have had a, several, depends on how many students I've got active, but I'll have anywhere from four to five students that are waiting for me to review their lessons and send back um, new assignments. <clears throat> and so then, um, but... Uh, the conversations are lengthy? Not really. Okay. Very, so very brief, no. Okay. Yeah, very brief. If, uh, for example, I'm looking at, I'm looking through their, I'm looking through the ones they answered incorrectly. Underneath what they, underneath all of them, whether they answered correctly or incorrectly for that matter, there would be an explanation. So if I want to, there's, there's always a space there that I can add a comment of my own. Um, for example, I don't know, I can't think of an exact example right now, but if, if I want to comment on something about the importance of the resurrection of Christ, I might just add something like, keep in mind how important the resurrection of Christ is. Uh, it is the foundation of our faith. Without the resurrection, we have no, we have there, there, we have no hope. I might add something like that to that comment just to highlight something that they've answered true or false along the way. And then when they get down to the last two or three, they will be discussion questions in which they're able to add. And it's going to be broken English for the most part. And and I might help them by saying, hey. You know, this is the words you were looking for, and I might add something of that note occasionally. But by and large, I don't. And um, and I'll just uh, I'll just add a comment. You know, if if they hit the if they hit with if they hit the ball and it's in the ballpark of of the point, I'll say very good answer, very good answer. You know, I want I want to continue to encourage them. I don't know if that helps or not, but my routine starts every morning like that. And it takes just a few minutes. In 10 minutes, you can review these lessons. It doesn't take long. But I take longer than that. But you can do it in 10 minutes if you wanted to. And give, that, give their lessons back to them. And you'd be surprised how that with some students, you can't, you can't go fast enough. They just eat it up. And they can't wait for these lessons to come in. Anyone else? <clears throat> If they do not know English, they will not pass the introductory exam. That's the thing. See, if they don't know English, they have to score at least, I think, 40% on the introductory. Because otherwise, they don't know English well enough for us to be able to communicate. You have to have that level of communication. Huh. At one time, I, I had a student in Peru. He's still a continuing student. Uh, actually, he's a denominational preacher down there, and uh, he's been a student for perhaps maybe almost two years now. And that's another thing, too, is that you're going to get a lot of uh, um, 
preachers uh, from denominations in those countries that want to want to learn and they they come to a greater knowledge and understanding of the truth through what you're able to help them to understand and so uh, but going back to this this fella uh, he uh, this student he uh, uh, first started communicating to me in uh, I don't know what I don't I don't what do they speak in Peru is it uh, por Spanish. Spanish not Portuguese like you do in Brazil uh, Okay, well, he was, he was communicating to me back in that language, and I said, you know, this is an English-based language you'll need to communicate to me in English. So he began to communicate to me in English at that point. That's a really good question, though, because um, if they can't communicate well enough in English, we just can't take them as students, which is sad because that means that there's a lot of students that don't get on the board that, that otherwise we, we would like for them to be. But believe me, there's, and by the way, <clears throat> we uh, we advertise through Google Ads worldwide, worldwide, and I think it's about uh, every time they click, every time somebody clicks on that ad, it costs us money. It costs us money. It's uh, a dollar and something per click, if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, it's a, there's quite a bit of money that's going out. We're not getting anything really much in return, but we are getting a lot of students. There are times when they have to shut down the advertisement to a particular location because we get overloaded with too, so many students. We don't have enough teachers to take them. We have, if you're, if you're interested in knowing about how many teachers that we have, we have about 800 active students, uh, teachers, about 800. That's still not enough to take on the number of students that we have that are interested in wanting to study and the potential that's out there because we have to shut the ads down to keep them from overloading us with so many so many students on the board we can't handle them all that's why we need teachers <clears throat> time is up i'm afraid unless you've got a question don't want to let anyone get away without asking a question i appreciate your listening thank you
Good morning and uh, welcome to everyone. And we have uh, several visitors. Uh, it's good to uh, good to have you with us this morning. And uh, we always uh, encourage you to drop by anytime that you have the opportunity. And some of you we don't really regard as visitors, but it's good to see Robin and Daryl back with us this morning. Daryl be bringing the message this morning as well. And he's here representing the Worldwide English Institute. Is that correct? And uh, had a lesson this morning in Bible class on that, and uh, very interesting. If you have uh, questions uh, about that, I'm sure he'd be uh, glad to answer those questions. Uh, Don and Peggy are away uh, this morning. Are they, are they in Somerset? They're at uh, Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon, okay. And uh, it's good, good to have Craig back with us this morning as well, back from Idaho. And uh, in, uh, in regards to the walk for water, uh, Thanks to everyone that participated in that, and from the ones I've talked to, it was a success. It raised over $3,500, and currently still taking donations for the cash donations for the next month. Is that correct? If you have interest in that, then see Craig or Emily, uh, Celia, uh, anyone that uh, that's interested in donating, please let them know. Uh, in the way of birthdays, I'm a little bit unorganized. I hope I haven't overlooked someone's birthday this morning, but I have these scribbled down. My notes are not really good. Uh, Ashley uh, Matney's birthday is June the 7th. Uh, Kim Smith's June the 12th. Also, Don and Peggy will celebrate their anniversary June the 12th. And today is Craig and Sarah's 40th. That's quite an accomplishment. So 40th anniversary, uh, happy anniversary to you guys. Uh, Don and, uh, excuse me, Molly and Ben will be, uh, let's continue to keep them in our prayers as they uh, are closing in on their uh, wedding date, uh, which is next Saturday, June the 12th, and let's keep them in, uh, in, our, in our prayers. Uh, also in the way of sick this morning, uh, Shauna's mom and dad, Joe and Martha Hurt, uh, let's continue to keep them in their prayers as she says they both are dealing with, with different health issues at this time. Uh, also, Carl Reed is, uh, and I talked to Anthony this morning, he's still not doing very well, and uh, let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, Linnell Cawthorn, and that's the wife of Barton Cawthorn, uh, Marty said she will be undergoing uh, cancer treatment soon. so. Keep her in her prayers as well. And Pam is not with us this morning because she is sick at home. And uh, Madison's uh, grandfather, Carlos Wilson, let's uh, put him back on a prayer list and keep him in her prayers as well. So uh, let's remember those that, are, that I just mentioned as they're sick. Uh, is there anything that I failed to announce that should be announced at this time? Randy's going to be leading us in song, and uh, we'll ask Craig, if you would, to lead us in prayer. Six hundred eighty-two, number six eight two. Let the people rejoice. 
prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning. We'll sing number 950, number 950. <clears throat>
I'm sure each and every one of us have put effort into thinking about uh, this day of worship. Maybe even you've prayed that we would be able to worship uh, God as He would have us to, and that it would be in spirit and in truth, and we'd have the right hearts. So we begin to think of this uh, Lord's Supper. I'm hoping that each and every one of us uh, understand the emotion of humility, that we understand what it's truly like to be humbled in the presence of greatness, and possibly even that uh, we would understand what a privilege it truly is just to be here, just to be able to uh, eat this bread and uh, drink this cup and to be considered a Lamb of God. As we think about the sacrifice that was made of that body that, uh, that was broken and hung there on the cross and of that blood that was shed, let's realize just what greatness we truly are in the presence of this moment. And let's be humbled by it. And let's consider it an honor and a privilege just to be able to partake of these emblems and to be loved by our Lord and Savior. If you would, uh, go with me in prayer. Father, we want to give you thanks for the bread, for the representation of his body that you gave to us that we might remember it weekly and that we might remember it daily and that we, Father, might think about uh, the love that was shown there on that cross and, and that we, Father, might really consider it an honor to, to be able to be called children of yours. We ask that you would bless it as, as we partake of it. In his name we pray. Amen. Father, we continue our thanks for this cup, the fruit from the vine that you uh, told us to use, that we might remember the blood that was shed, that we might ever be drawn closer, that we, Father, might be more loving and forgiving and kind because of that sacrifice that was made, and that we, Father, might be forgiven. We give you thanks for it. In his name we pray. Amen. Before we're led in prayer this morning, we'll sing number 680. Number 680. Oh, 
Let us pray together. Dear God and our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, this friend that you've given unto us, the one who can stand beside us and the one who knows what we have gone through in life, the one who's made the sacrifice for us. We are so thankful for Jesus, for that love that he demonstrated in going to the cross and being nailed to it. Our Heavenly Father, we are come to you in deep respect and in deep awe, knowing that you created this world, that you just simply spoke it into existence, which demonstrates your power, and that you keep it going for us, so that you keep providing for us, so that you give us the very breath that we breathe. We're thankful, dear God, that you did create us, that you love us, and that you have used your wisdom to um, not only keep this world going, but to provide that way for us, the sacrifice that Jesus made. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we will always love you because of that, that we'll demonstrate our love to you and striving to obey you and, and striving to uh, have you live within our lives and that we can demonstrate your being within our lives to the world round about us. We pray that we'll never bring disgrace or shame upon you. Dear God, we are, are thankful for the Bible that you've given us, that it tells us where we came from, uh, that it tells us about the great plan that you have been working and continue to work in this creation. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that we will always love and honor it, that we'll study it and that we'll do our very best to try to understand the truths that are dire, realizing that there are indeed objective truths within it and that it's not open to our private interpretation, but that it's, it's something that uh, you meant for all people. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the church, especially the congregation here, and the love and the care that we feel for one another the great uh, friendship and brotherhood that we have for one another. We pray that that will grow uh, stronger each day that we live and each time that we're able to meet together, especially upon the first day of the week when we worship you. Dear God, we, we pray that you'll help us as a congregation to uh, have a, a view to others, uh, an outside view wanting to bring others into our fellowship, wanting to help others to, to see their need for you, realizing that they are indeed lost. And we have pray, our Heavenly Father, that we will feel an urgency in trying to bring others to you. We're thankful that we were able to have the walk for water yesterday. We're thankful for uh, all that took place and all that were involved. And we pray that much good can come from that. We're thankful for the opportunities that we have in other ways, whether it's uh, preaching through the gospel meetings or uh, the radio program or the house to house and, and all the other things that we're able to do. We pray that you'll help us to uh, always have one thing in mind with that, and that is to bring you honor and glory. We're thankful for our nation, for this country that we live in. It's a great and wonderful country. We have so many freedoms. And we pray that we'll continue to have those freedoms. 
but we pray our Heavenly Father that uh, whatever is your will will be done within it and that uh, you will guide us uh, to the, the greatness of your kingdom and to the spreading of your kingdom and you will use us always for the, the spreading of your kingdom. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are, are sick, uh, those that are uh, having many difficulties within their lives, whether they're physical or emotional or, or mental or spiritual. We pray that you'll bless them, that you'll guide them, that you'll be with them. Dear God, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, and may we always have a very penitent attitude. Keep us in your care. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please, if you, uh, if you will, mark number 740 as our song invitation, number 740. For our lesson this morning, we'll sing number 823, number 823. We'll sing the first and last verse. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. Coming after you and me, he joins us to share. What rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise. Headed for that jubilee under in the skies. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting. On that happy morning when we all shall rise. Savior in the skies. When with all that heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring. Millions there will join the song, with them we shall be. Praising Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. Good morning. morning. Boy, it sure is a good crowd today. I don't know if you uh, have been like most congregations, and then when I say most, I really am saying just about all congregations in the past year. Of course, we were at Cumberland. When I was at Cumberland, <clears throat> there was a period of time when we couldn't meet. Uh, we were on uh, Facebook, and uh, so many of the members uh, tuned in there, but when it uh, finally came time for us to begin to come back it was sort of a trickling back but it looks like now boy things are rebounding and it's just really good to see everyone this morning and it's good to see the numbers uh, just about a full house and uh, it's just encouraging to me it's encouraging to me too to be here as a guest to speak with you or to you this morning uh, in the Bible class as Ronnie mentioned I'm here and I'm on behalf of World English Institute and World English Institute is just a, another tool to be able to reach out into the world for the gospel and with the gospel. And World, world English Institute, uh, it uses the teaching of English grammar uh, in the international world uh, and uh, co in combination with the Bible in order to be able to get the Bible into the hearts and minds and hopefully the lives and Christ into the hearts and minds and hopefully, hopefully the lives of the people that are studying. 
And so uh, it's, it's, gr it's greatly successful, and it is just every month it continues to be uh, amazing to us in, the, in terms of numbers. And so we are just looking for more teachers. And when I say teachers, it's more or less study helpers. And so if you're interested in thinking about that, I can help you uh, with that and, uh, and just give you more detail uh, that you might need. And also some literature you can take with you to read and go on to the website and just investigate for yourself to see if it might fit you. But again, it's, it's a pleasure to be back. And uh, I just want us to concentrate a little bit this morning on something that's mentioned in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Matthew chapter 9. There's an interesting passage there that's written about an, an event. Well, several events took place in that chapter, but there's one that sort of concludes with there in that chapter. And in, uh, it says in uh, verse 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was m moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. One of the things that, and if we go back a little bit and try our best to try to sort of be there and sort of uh, envision the crowds and the multitudes that were coming his direction, and, and, uh, and as the disciples were amazed at the following that he was getting because of the multitudes, um, they were probably likewise amazed at the very words that he just spoke to them. They wouldn't have thought uh, that the crowds and the multitudes being like lost sheep, but that's what Jesus said, and that's how he described them, that they were very much like sheep, lost sheep, sheep without a shepherd. Um, one of the things that drew the people, of course, was Jesus' power, his ability to be able to perform miracles. He was doing some great and marvelous things. If we go back to the first of the chapter in, in Matthew chapter 9, we find there how that Jesus did something that no one else had ever done. And he healed a man, but he not only healed him, he said, your sins are forgiven. He forgave the sins of a man. And so then we find there, uh, we find there that he did something that, that no one dared ever do pronounce forgiveness for somebody. In other words, no one would come up to someone and, and speak on behalf of God and speak as God, as it were, and say, your sins are forgiven. That raised a lot of eyebrows. It raised eyebrows with people who believed that Jesus was true to the son of David, the Messiah. And they, they, they knew that, that with the Messiah was going to come the forgiveness of sins. There are others that were in the crowd, it, it raised their eyebrows because they, they saw it as blasphemy that uh, there, no one has the right to be able to speak on behalf of God that way, to, to literally forgive sins of a person. So that you had those people as well. You had people in the crowd who were just curious. Maybe they were just Jesus and how that the, he was doing what he was doing. Maybe they were fascinated with the things that he was doing, and so they were following him out of, out of curiosity. So you've got a lot of different people in the crowd and in the multitude not only wanting and seeking help, just like this man needed help, and just like the woman who had an issue of blood, verse 20, it talks about her, how that she had an issue of blood and was healed. And, and, and then you've got, you've got uh, others in the crowd that, um, uh, others in the crowd that simply just were there, they were there, just didn't believe at all. The Pharisees at that period of time, and those that were a part of the Sanhedrin, it was customary for, that, for them to, to send out a delegation. And there were a lot of different people who rose up and, and claimed to be a Messiah. Uh, there's a, actually a record that gives about uh, 50 names uh, in that period of time in history that claimed to be a Messiah. Um, so they figured maybe this was just one of a, of a string of different men who were rising up trying to gain a following and just wanting uh, some uh, uh, popularity, wanting some fame, and maybe even fortune, so they would send out a delegation and they would interrogate those who thought, thought themselves to be candidates to be Messiah. And so this is pretty much what they did. They followed Jesus and they went about and they interrogated Jesus about different things. The only thing was is that Jesus didn't measure up to the Messiah that they believed that the Messiah should. 
that's the way it is today in a lot of ways. A lot of times people just, they, they look at Jesus and they say, well, he just doesn't measure up to what I think that the Messiah, the Christ, ought to be. There's a lot of people that follow, or may, maybe just from a distance, maybe just out of curiosity, they just want to know a little bit about him and just actually just sort of just uh, entertain the thought of, the, of what he has to say and maybe some things about the Bible. Uh, there are the others that are fascinated with the power that Jesus had, at least through Scripture. They're reading Scripture and they see the power of Jesus being written there. And they may not fully believe that that actually happened, but that's pretty amazing that if he did. And then there are others, there are others like the disciples that were following Jesus. They were not riding the fence in any way. They were really in very much his camp, but they were still amazed nonetheless. And they were constantly amazed by the things that he said and how that he revealed himself to be who he says that he is. Ultimately, of course, the resurrection is going to prove it all. And that's one of the things that I try to, uh, when I'm teaching my students, as we're going along and as we're talking about uh, how Jesus is coming and, and there's the predictions in the Old Testament about his coming and then when Jesus finally comes, and they're reading about all of these things. They're reading about these amazing things that he did. And they're also reading about these amazing claims that he made. One of them being in John chapter 8 where he says, Before Abraham was, I am. That's quite an astonishing statement for anyone to make also that he is the I am, the eternal one. The one who spoke to Moses from the burning bush, that's him. The one who laid the foundation of the world, that's him. The one that said, I'm coming, that's him. So it's amazing they are they're amazed at what he says but it's ultimately the resurrection that proves it all and that's one of the things that I try to encourage my students if they're if they're very much on the fence or if they're not even on the fence if they're expressing doubt that Jesus is who he says that he is and even sometimes will say I don't believe that Jesus is the son of God I will always tell them let's listen to Jesus talk about himself let's listen to him speak about himself and let him tell us who he is and then ultimately we get to the resurrection and then the resurrection then the resurrection is proof that he is all that he claimed to be and that's where many times the students will be amazed and they I've had one student who was actually Muslim who said I am I'm convinced now that Jesus is the Son of God others others they don't know what to say it's new to them they've never heard anything like this they've never heard that before they've never really seen the, how things come together in the Bible, that the Bible is really one big story. They've never read the Bible, not the first verse. When you begin in, the, begin in creation and you walk through the Old Testament, and it takes it in pretty good sized chunks so that they can actually grasp it all, so that they can get the story quicker. But it, 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 they, they see the story unfolding as they go along until they get to Jesus, and then you get the resurrection of Christ, and that's that's the event to which it all points to. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. This may, be, may come as a surprise to you, but did you know that Christianity is not based upon teachings? Now, you might say, well, Daryl, you know, how can we know about Jesus Christ? How can we know about the resurrection how, without teachings? That's true. That's true. They're very true. But which came first? The resurrection came first. And then the teaching about the resurrection came after. So our faith is based upon an event, and an historical event. Did you know that every other religion in the world is based upon teachings? They're based upon teachings, not historical events per se. Now there are historical events within those religious um, uh, religions, and there are historical people within those religions. But their religion is not built, built, upon, built upon historical events, they're built upon the teachings instead. Christianity is the only, the only one in the world that is built upon in a historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why that we, we were constantly pointing to the resurrection. We observed, we observed the Lord's Supper. That was, the, that was instituted uh, the night before Jesus went to the cross. And, uh, and ultimately was raised from the dead. But what's the latter part of what we need to be doing with regard to the Lord's Supper? We're to remember his death till he comes. That's what Paul said. That imp uh, imp uh, implies the resurrection because Jesus cannot return if he had not left. He, could not, he cannot return if he's not risen. 
So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is even the center of the Lord's Supper. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be no purpose for the, the Lord's Supper. So it's, you're pointing them to the resurrection of Christ. It's a good thing for us to remember too. How many people know anything much about the importance of the resurrection of Christ that you know of in the circles that you, in which you live? Maybe some. Maybe they know some, but not much. Maybe they know a lot. And that's good. But there's a lot of people in the world who don't know the first thing. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach those people who don't know the very first thing. Or maybe even those that maybe have pieces of the puzzle that just need to be put together. We're trying to reach them too. You know, there's about four different points I'd like for us to consider in this passage right here in Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> and one of them is that the disciples did not produce the harvest. That's point number one. If you'll notice, the disciples were there. Jesus said, look, the multitudes were coming. And the, what did the disciples do to produce that harvest? They didn't produce the harvest, did they? It was Jesus who produced the harvest. So what I'm trying to say is, is not, I'm not trying to imply that, that there's nothing that you and I can do. There's, yes, there is something that you and I must do. As Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22, the latter part of the verse there, he said, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So he's, he, he, has, he has upon his heart a tremendous responsibility in order to be able to take the gospel of Christ and then be able to not change the gospel of Christ not, not try to fit it into a different mold, but take that gospel of Christ and, 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 and work in a way so that it communicates to the mind of the person that he's trying to reach. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to communicate to people so that they, the gospel can reach them. Not changing it, as I'm reminded of this passage all the time in Jeremiah, where God told Jeremiah, he said, he said, do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. Then he said, do not diminish a word later on in that book. Do, do not diminish a word. Those two, those two commandments are exactly what we need to hold to as well. It's what every preacher who stands in this pulpit needs to do. In every pulpit in the world, he needs to not be dismayed before their faces, lest God dismay him him before them and then he, he, he is not to diminish a word. You and I in, in, in talking to someone about the gospel of Christ maybe adding a little bit here today and tomorrow we add a little bit more and maybe water what we did yesterday and maybe plant a little bit tomorrow and what we're doing is that we are just we're, we're adding and not diminishing the word of God to their hearts. We're not taking anything away from their hearts we're trying our best to take the Word of God, and we're trying to plant the Word of God in their hearts. So there are responsibilities that you and I have in order to be able to generate a harvest. But the thing is, to, for us to remember, you and I, you and I do not produce the harvest. It is God who produces the harvest. You and I do not produce baptisms. We simply share the Word of God and let God do that. He's the one who produces the baptisms, and, and he's the one who grows the church. Isn't it Paul who said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that God gives the increase? He may plant, Apollos may water, and vice versa for that matter, but it is God who ultimately gives the increase. That takes a lot off my shoulders. I don't know about you, but that it takes a lot off my shoulders because I carried a lot on my shoulders that, that wasn't mine to carry. I really felt guilty a lot of times when, when, it, when, it, when I thought I failed because someone didn't obey the gospel. I used to think that if someone didn't respond and be baptized after a sermon, I did something wrong. And, and sometimes we feel the same way, and I tell my teachers that, that, that express similar sentiments, it's not your fault if a student doesn't reply the way you would like for them to respond. It's not your fault, so don't carry the burden of uh, thinking that you did something wrong, you've done everything right, it's just, uh, it's, it's now for them to respond in the appropriate way, whether they choose to or whether they do not. And it also might be that it, that, uh, it might be that you're sowing the seed and it's going to take a while for there to be a harvest. You know, we're at a period of time this, this year and every year, this time of year, 
in which there's a lot going on, a lot going on in the farms. Uh, there's tobacco being set. There's corn being planted and should have already been planted by now. There's, uh, uh, there's soybeans. I've noticed a field of soybeans is just now sprouting up. And, but there's also wheat that's not going to be too long before it's going to be coming off. So you see, we're doing a lot of things. Um, when you're working in the, uh, when you're working and you're planting corn, you know, you're not at the same time over here in the wheat field that's not ready to be harvested. You're waiting for it to get ready to harvest. So, but you're working over here at the moment and planting the seed. Same thing with the soybeans and so forth. Over at this field, you might be taking the hay off because that hay's ready, that, 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 that corn's planted, and the beans are planted, and the wheat is getting still getting ready. It's not ready yet, but you're over here taking hay off of this field. We understand that. We live in a, we live in a farming community, and, and, and practically, practically all of us have been brought up on farms. We understand those principles. Why can't we understand the spiritual principles that are similar to that? You see, because we work, we, we need to work in different fields and understand that a person is a different field. Every person is a different field. This person is maybe just needs to be cultivated a little bit before anything's planted. Maybe this person is ready for the seed to be planted, so you plant the seed. Maybe that with this person, there's somewhere down the line in, in their life, someone's planted the seed and it's growing and doing very well. And, uh, and all you need to do is just just tend to that, to, to let it grow a little bit more so that it can actually come to a harvest. You see, we work in different fields too. We just don't think of it that way. But for some reason, for some reason, you know, it, it, a, a, a farmer, if he goes out into a, a cornfield and that corn is up two inches, he doesn't walk away disheartened because that corn's not ready. He knows it's got a ways to go. When we walk away from people, we need to feel the same way. We needn't always be disheartened because someone hasn't responded the way in which we think they ought to respond as long as we're doing what we need to be doing. The disciples didn't produce the harvest. You and I cannot produce the harvest either. All we can do are the, are the things within our power and our ability at that moment to be able to do what we can and then be satisfied with what we've been able to do and let God take the rest. I think if we operated that way, we'd be a whole lot happier as Christians and be less hard on ourselves thinking that I, you know, thinking perhaps maybe that I'm not what I need to be. We need to be, we need to lighten up on ourselves, I think, a lot because I think we're doing what we need to be doing. God's doing his work. It's going to depend upon those that we, we're working with to respond as God and I and you would have them to respond. So that's the first point. The second point is this. The second point uh, is that prayer is essential. Prayer is essential. He says, the Lord says there, pray the, the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest. So prayer is essential. We need to be praying for the people we're working with. We need to be praying for, if, you, if you're a world English student, and if you choose, to, or rather, well, student for that matter, but, but a teacher, if you, if you choose to be a teacher, a student helper, then pray for those that you're working with online. And uh, pray for other teachers that are working. Pray for all, for all the students, the thousands of students that are studying. Prayer is essential. And um, I don't, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. I have to be honest with you. And maybe some of you maybe can help me out with this. I fully, I don't know and can't fully understand the power of prayer. I mean, I'm just being open and honest with you. I can't fully understand the power of prayer. I know one thing I do know, it's powerful. It works. It works. All of us have been recipients of the benefits of prayer. All of us have. We can't fully understand its power sometimes. We can't fully understand how does this work? How does this, this, this ability to be able to communicate with God, which is such a great honor, how does it work? We may not have all the answers to that. But Jesus said, pray, pray. So, you know, that takes another bit of, of a burden off of my shoulders. I don't, I don't have to understand how prayer has to work in order for it to work. I just need to pray. I don't have to fully understand how things happen where prayer is involved. 
I just need to pray. And I need to pray um, that, Lord, that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. And, and leave that to him, by the way, in order to send them. One of these days, I mean, he could send you. He could, he could tap your shoulder in some way. Someone might speak a word to you. And <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I remember many years ago, Paul Smith came to me. He said, you need to be an evangelist before I was even thinking about being, you know, being an evangelist. But that was Paul, wasn't it? He, I think he said that to every young man. You need to be an evangelist. Well, <clears throat> you just never know who's going to say that one word that's going to encourage that person to do that. And, um, and, and young ladies, uh, some might, someone might come to you and say, you know, you'd make a good teacher. Why don't you come with me to Bible class and learn with me how to teach the Bible class? You never know what's going to come out of that. Things like that uh, are ways to be able, for God to be able to, to uh, use those ways providentially to be able to raise up laborers into his harvest. So there's a lot of different ways in which prayer works. And he works through those ways providentially. But prayer is a part of our responsibility that we need to continue to pray. Pray for the harvest. Pray for the harvest. You know, there are areas in the world we cannot reach. World English Institute can reach into dark places of the world. All 51 Muslim-majority nations were reaching into those nations with these studies. Uh, I have about uh, 45 to 50 Muslim students that I'm studying with presently. And all of them are, are doing, doing wonderfully uh, in their studies. And they do stumble when they come to Jesus, but I have learned to be able to help them get past that hurdle and get to where, it, uh, where they learn about Jesus, who he says that he is, and the resurrection, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and I've been able to be successful with some, and at least in convincing them, hey, everything that you were taught in Islam may not be true, and it isn't. Um, but what we need to do, what we need to do is we just need to be available, make ourselves available in some way. And I think that's perhaps maybe the bottom line, most important thing. And, uh, and, and, and you might say, well, I think that all I can do is pray. Well, do so, please, because you don't know just how powerful that really is. The laborers are few, Jesus said. The laborers are few. We've got, um, uh, I, I said this morning in Bible class, as of yesterday, 212 students that are waiting for teachers. And come to think of it, 209, just there was only about three taken off uh, this morning. Or I say three taken off, you never know how many is being added back. 209 this morning, 212 yesterday, and we just don't have enough teachers to just make it zero because we just have too many students that are coming on, constantly coming on. It takes 800 teachers to constantly be taking students. And, and I don't want to give the impression that this is a laborious thing. It's not, it's not. I told uh, 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 Clint this morning that uh, I take about, uh, I take a little longer naturally, and I take a little bit longer, but you can do this 10 minutes a day. I like to tell people you can be a missionary from your kitchen table. And that's a fascinating thing. You can be a missionary from your kitchen table, taking only 10 minutes a day to be a student helper. But we've got, we've got more people than we can actually take on. I mentioned also this morning that we use Google Ads in order to be able to reach out into the world. We sometimes have to shut those down because we have too many students. I didn't mention that this, this, this morning, but give you an illustration. in. Uh, Myanmar, uh, we suddenly were swamped with hundreds of teachers from that country. We, didn't, we couldn't understand. Why are we being swamped? I said teachers, students. Uh, we're, we're being swamped with hundreds of students from that country. And so the word went out and said, hey, we're just getting swamped with hundreds of students from Myanmar. And uh, we just need some of you teachers to take on a few extra, if you don't mind, to, to, to prevent these from waiting so long. So we did. We found out that there were some missionaries that put an ad in a paper, and, 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 and that triggered uh, kind of a ch chain reaction. One person told this person, then it was posted on uh, 
social media, and it just and it just just uh, snowballed to where we were just getting hundreds of requests. That's the way it happens, and there are, there's just you know the story after story like that. The laborers are few. So Jesus said, when he said to the disciples, he said, truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And then he said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest. Not only was that true for that day, but that's true for every day. And that's especially true now. Whether it's looking globally or whether it's looking locally. I know that there's a lot of work that Center does, a lot, of, a lot of work continually, has always done a lot of work locally, continue to do that, continue working locally because you're sowing the seed and you never know when there's going to be that one person that's going to be baptized into Christ. You know, I think you mentioned, Craig, you mentioned uh, uh, house to house, heart to heart. That's a good way to get into their homes when otherwise you might not be able to and that's sowing some seed. And uh, maybe sometime you can just maybe kind of knock a few doors and ask them what they think about that publication. You might be able to reach someone that way that more person, in a more personal way. But um, I'll tell you one time that happened to me, and I was preaching at Mount Vernon. And, um, and I was just going from house to house of different folks that had just moved into the community. And um, this just goes to show you how that you never know. And I knocked on the door, and the wife came to the door, and the husband, whose name I had, I asked for him. Said she said, "Well, he's not here right now." And I said, "Well, I told her where I was and where I was from, and so forth. Gave her some literature, and uh, just wished her a good day." Uh, and, and I don't know, maybe two weeks later, I had already forgotten all about any of that and uh, conversation. And uh, he drove up to the church building. I happened to be there. And he said, are you the preacher that came to my house? And I said, well, I don't know. And he told me where he lived. And I said, well, yes, I met your wife. And uh, she, he said, I want to be a part of this church. And I said, okay. So he said, you're the only person that's ever come to my door. You're the only one that's cared enough to come to my door. I studied the gospel with him and baptized him. A few years later, I did his funeral. So you never know. You never know. You never know who you're going to reach. But that's all a part of it, you see. Um, maybe what I didn't know was that there was some seed that was sown that had already been sown that just needed a little bit of encouragement. And then the gospel needed to be explained more accurately so that he could come to Christ. So there's the harvest. Who did that? Not me. Not me. All I did was just share the word of God with him, share the gospel. God did that. God did that. So you see, you just, you just never know. And that's why that we should never give up and give up hope. That's why that we need to keep going and never become discouraged. Don't take on more on your shoulders than God would lay upon them. And all he's laid upon our shoulders is just to preach the word, just tell his story. There's a lot of ways to do that. World English Institute is only one of many. And if you want to become involved in it in some way, even congregationally, I'm not here to raise any money either, but if you're interested in financially helping us to reach out better and more effectively, there's always that opportunity there too. But more than that, more than that, this morning, my purpose for being here is not only to share the Word of God with you, but to share this good work with you it might encourage you to become a part of it personally if you're interested. Now, <clears throat> I think the song we're about to sing is What Will You Do With Jesus? Is that correct, the title? So that's a good place for us to end this morning. What will you do with Jesus? That's always where we wind up. That question is always where we wind up. What will you do with Jesus? At the end of two courses, uh, they have uh, studied from Genesis all the way through the church, what the church is, what it means to live for Christ, and then at the end of those two courses, it's decision time. I, like, I make it decision time. What will you do with Jesus? I may not put it in those exact words, but I want to encourage them to think about the big story and how they can be and fit into it. 
you can fit into that story. The story is not only his, the story's ours. What will you do with Jesus? If you haven't been baptized into Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Everything's ready. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and begin your walk with Christ. And then, but if you have already done that, you feel like that you have slipped and in, 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 in no longer walking in his footsteps like you once did, you want to get back and you just want help. And so that we might be able to pray with you, we can do that too. We'd love to do that with you. I'd like to ask you, if there's anyone here this morning and you're subject to that invitation, would you come as we stand and sing? Jesus is standing in my soul. This forsaken betrayed my heart. I am one be at the Son of God. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do? again for having us and uh, allowing me to be able to speak this morning. I uh, always enjoy the opportunity. It's good to see everyone. Lord willing, we'll be able to see more of each other because we've moved back into the community. So we'll run into each other, if not just run into each other at Walmart maybe or something like that. But it's good to see everyone and it's going to be good to be back home. Does anybody have any announcements? No. Okay. Our closing song will be number 627. We'll sing the first verse. I'd like to ask uh, Marty if you would to uh, lead our closing prayer. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way.
pray, Heavenly Father, it's been according to your will and that you have been pleased by what we have done here this morning. We're thankful for the work that Earl and Robin are doing, and we're thankful for all the fishing work that is going on throughout the world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to always be able to do our part. We pray now that you go with the Father to, throughout the day and throughout the life. Finally, give us that home with you in heaven and the life of the Lord. Pray that you forgive us of our sins. It's through Jesus we do pray. Amen. 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 Amen.